Welcome to this webinar. Welcome to all of our guests here in UAP studio in Brisbane. Welcome also to all of our viewers online. We have over 100 people here today tuning in from around Australia, China, Singapore, the US and also Hong Kong. Thank you all for taking the time to join us. It's fantastic to have you with us. Today I'm presenting UAP's take on the best public art projects of 2016. My name is Natasha Smith and I am a principal at UAP. I head up our curatorial teams globally with our core teams located in Australia and China. Our amazing curatorial team has researched and debated over the past few weeks to agree on our final list of the top 10 projects that in our opinion capture the very best public art from 2016. It has not been an easy task as this year has presented its fair share of stellar art projects. So you might ask, what has guided our selection? As a multidisciplinary company specialising in public art and underpinned by an ethos of creative collaboration, we believe that public art can come in many diverse forms and as such we've sought out a diverse collection of works. All of these works shown are also of course for the public, in public spaces with free and open access. And each project demonstrates an ability to potently engage with local and global audiences through both conceptual rigour and innovative use of medium. We've also placed an importance on the work's ability to poignantly engage in a dialogue with current and historical social and cultural issues. These top 10 projects will be presented in chronological order. Just as a little bit of housekeeping for our online viewers, please, if you could hold questions to the end of the presentation, that would be great. And we'll have a dedicated Q&A session via messaging. Now, without further ado, please sit back and enjoy as I take you through the top 10 works that have made up UAP's take on the best public art of 2016. First up, installed in February 2016, we have the highly controversial and quite possibly the most hashtagged work of the year, Ai Weiwei's life jacket installation on Berlin's Concert House. Ai Weiwei fixed 14,000 discarded life jackets bought from the Greek islands of Lesbos to the columns of the Concert House to highlight the plight of refugees trying to reach Europe. An inflatable life raft blasted with the hashtag safe passage hung in the middle of the columns. The hashtag safe passage had an international reach of just over 1.7 million people with over 2 million impressions between Facebook and Instagram. Despite a healthy dose of criticism via social media channels, Ai Weiwei later completed another installation using life jackets at Vienna's Belvedere Palace in July this year. In addition, he opened his Safe Passage exhibition at Foam Museum Amsterdam between September to December. And since last December, he shared dozens of images of refugees who have come to Lesbos on his own personal Instagram account. The controversial and dividing Ai Weiwei's artwork has assisted in mobilising a potent dialogue of what is one of the most significant crises of 2016. And for that at UAP, we see this as a project worthy of praise and certainly worthy of talking about further. In the artist's own words, if my art has nothing to do with people's pain and sorrow, what is art for? Certainly something to think about. Now from the controversial to the affable. At number two, we have Martin Creed's Understanding installed in May 2016 at Pier 6 Brooklyn Bridge Park in New York City. Curated by Andrea Hickey, Understanding adapts the Times Square language of roadside signs and neon advertising to spell out understanding. This work is on a rotating beam and rotates a full 360 degrees. It's 15 metres in length and 8 metres tall. And it has stairs incorporated into the footings to ena enable people to sit beneath the work. In addition to this major piece, Creed held a number of exhibitions globally throughout the year, most notably his understanding exhibition in Shanghai in conjunction with the West Bund Art and Design Fair. We feel that this work, aside from being visually very captivating, effectively speaks to the state of the world, especially in the year of the US presidential election, and offers a welcome call for empathy, and one could say a little perspective. 
The work humorously yet sensitively offers a suggestion to viewers, but doesn't impose interpretation, which we also love. Creed's own thoughts on the work are also very humorous. He states, it came from thinking about the state of the world. Actually, the piece was originally going to be called Peace, Love and Understanding, and it was going to have these three parts to it, but we had to cut down to, two, down to the one due to economic constraints. So I figured that understanding was the key to the other two. Now from <clears throat> stepping up that positive tone with all its Dago Gori is Ugo Rondonone's Seven Magic Mountains at number three. Installed in May 2016, it's located in the scenic desert outside Las Vegas, Nevada. Situated along Interstate 15, approximately a half hour from downtown LA, the site-specific sculpture has seven nine to 10 meter high Dago totems, and it's comprised of painted, locally sourced limestone boulders. Produced by Art Production Fund New York and Nevada Museum of Art, Reno, the work cost 3.5 million US dollars. It took Rondonone five years to complete and is one of the largest land art pieces created in the US in the past 40 years. An estimated 16 million vehicles will pass by this installation during its two year run. And the New York Times significantly noted that this piece is part of a decades long tradition of large scale land art in the area. Rondonone also held exhibitions in Rome and Rotterdam this year and was featured just two weeks ago in Art Basel, Miami. What really stands out to us about this work, aside from the drop dead gorgeous candy colored forms, is that it draws people out from the city center to a remote location for the primary purpose of seeing an artwork. It celebrates landscape, landscape, pays homage to history and to the relevance of land art and offers a very sophisticated contemporary dialogue between nature and the man-made. In Ronda Nono's own words, Seven Magic Mountains elicits continuities and solidarities between human nature, artificial and natural, then and now. At number four, we depart from candy colored dreams, but retain a sense of playfulness, elevating our imaginations onto a new pedestrian plane with the Radica Radical Architecture Studio MVRDV's Stairs to Criterion. Installed between the months of May and June 2016 outside Rotterdam Central Station in the Netherlands. Defying categorization with the simple fields of architecture and urbanism, MVRDV employs a design philosophy that focuses on the urban landscape, the public realm, and the influence of architecture on the public. Celebrating 75 years since Rotterdam began its post-war reconstruction, the temporary installation of stairs allowed the public to look upon this awe-inspiring structure and if game to climb the 180 steps up to the roof of the first building constructed after the end of the Second World War. It's 20 me 29 metres high, 57 metres in length, and it welcomed over 300,000 visitors. The Innovative Studio also won a public award at last week's Dutch Design Awards for 2016. We really feel that this installation offers something unique to the public by reimagining people's relationships to their city, allowing the city to be experienced in a new and exciting way. And in the words of the architects themselves, with this installation, in our exhibition, we show what the city could look like. If we do that in many places, engaging a series of our existing buildings and giving access to their roofs to create a new, much more interactive, three-dimensional and denser urban topography for the next generation. At number five, from experimental radical architecture in the form of art to art that adorns iconic architecture. We travel to one of the most famous art museums in the world to see artist J.R.'s installation on the IMP pyramid outside the Louvre in Paris, installed between May and June 2016. A large photographic wrap covers the iconic glass pyramid, causing it to appear 
and disappear against the palace facade as people pass the site. The Trompe l'Oeil was created by the artist plastering the pyramid's 700 glass segments with archival prints of the museum. When viewed from just the right vantage point, it creates an illusion of the pyramid seeming to vanish as the Louvre's original facade takes over. For some 10 years now, JR's monumental photographic collages have been popping up on the walls of cities in all four corners of the globe. He's also very well known to us this year for his installations that were featured with athletes and community members shown in Rio for the Olympic Games. We see JR's transformation of the iconic and once controversial Iron Pay Pyramid as a successful merging of two great French icons, the Louvre and the Pyramid into one unified experience, an experience that is subject to its perspective and an experience designed to be best enjoyed from the street by the average passerby, a true homage to JR's street art roots. JR states that the street is an open air museum my work allows the transmission of past stories to better understand the present and find echo with the times. Coming in at number six, we don't have to travel too far from Paris to Italy to see the work of one of the greatest public artists of our time, Christo, with his temporary yellow walkway across the surface of Lake Isio and the mainland connecting the islands of Monte Isola and San Paolo installed in June 2016. This project marks Christo's first large-scale project since Christo and Jean-Claude realized the gates in New York City in 2005 and since Jean-Claude passed in 2009. This installation consisted of 100,000 square meters of shimmering yellow fabric carried by a modular floating dock system of 220,000 high density polyphylene cubes that undulated with the movement of the waves. 200 concrete dead weight anchors weighing 5.5 tons each stabilized the walkway. Like all of Christo and Jean-Claude's projects before, it was funded solely through the sale of Christo, Christo's artworks. The project was estimated to cost 11 million, but was later reported closer to 17 million. After the 16 day exhibition, all components were removed and industrially, industrially recycled. Local officials estimated that it had attracted 1.2 million visitors. Over 100,000 people were employed by the Floating Piers project. So why did this project make our top, top 10? Well, quite simply, because it was fantastico as the Italians would say. And as Christo notes, like all of our projects, the floating piers were absolutely free and open to the public. There were no tickets, no openings, no reservations, and no owners. The floating piers were an extension of the street and belonged to everyone. A truly amazing gift to the visitors who were fortunate enough to experience it. At number seven, we have another ephemeral project, though much smaller in scale from Christo's, but by no means smaller in its significance. Barangal Daira, Skin and Bones by Indigenous Australian artist Jonathan Jones was installed in October 2016 in the Sydney Royal Botanic Gardens in Australia. Produced by Caldor Art Projects and curated by Hetty Perkins, the installation consisted of 15,000 white bleached shields installed across 20,000 square metres of the Royal Botanic Gardens. The project was supported through collaboration between a wide range of partners. Joan's installation recalls the footprint of the 19th century Garden Palace building in its original location before it was burnt to the ground, along with countless Indigenous artefacts. Eight soundscapes sit within the site, contributed by eight different communities response to the story of the Garden Palace. The center of the installation was activated and enlivened by a rich and varied program of presentations of indigenous language, performance, talks, special events, and workshops each day during the 17 day life of the work. For our team, this work has a very special place on our top 10. As an Australian founded company, we're very aware that this work represents an important effort to commence healing process for this traumatic event. The most difficult element Jones reflects in his own words has been how to tell the story in a way that doesn't compound existing feelings around colonization and the cultural deconstruction that took place. 
to not make people feel worse about that history and instead use the story to make people feel empowered and that we're still moving forwards. At number eight, we continue our journey into the realm of the ephemeral to a significant performative project entitled Walk Hands Eyes by artist Miriam Lekovitz, located in Plymouth in the United Kingdom and held in September 2016. Part of an ongoing project reenacted across numerous cities, the Plymouth project consisted of a guided series of walks across the city centre. Over the course of an hour, the participant and guide form a silent and very immersive relationship with their surroundings through the simple acts of walking, seeing and touching. The participant keeps their eyes closed and at select times they're asked to open them. The simple aim of the experience is to counter, encounter the city anew. Lekovitz is currently compiling these accounts into a book on interactions at work between topographic reality of urban terrain and how geography is reflected in these perspective experiences. As Miriam states about the work, the walk should have the capacity to let us experience a reality that contains the possibility of a transformation, a reality that doesn't have this fixed and taken for granted shape that we need to deal with when we are busy with all the things that we have to do. I'm very interested in the relation between the sensory augmentation and imaginary activity. I'm trying to create the conditions for us to acknowledge new worlds. From the sensory and subtle to the sculptural and monumental with a good dose of irony. At number nine, we have the iconic Fourth Plinth 2016 commission with David Shrigley's sculpture entitled Really Good, installed in September and currently still on show in Trafalgar Square, London. A seven meter high hand giving a thumbs up. The work is cast in bronze with that same dark patina as other sculptures in the square. The thumb is disproportionately long in a Pinocchio-esque gesture, offering a playful twist on the traditional gesture and begging the question, is everything really good? One must ask, is this really a desperate response to the commission guidelines, which demanded that the work be positive at all costs? In Shrigley's words, as an artist, you have to believe your work makes the world a better place. Art is a positive intervention, even if it deals with something difficult. So I've made a statement, which is ironic, but when I read it, I actually believed it. So is it ironic or is it sincere? Well, I'm saying to you now on the record that it's both. Either way, we like it and we feel that it has a place on our top 10, not only as another great example of the fourth Plint's iconic collection, but also as a timely social and controversial conversation starter in the British capital, especially in the wake of Brexit. And now we come to our last project, which propels us firmly into the light at number 10, Last but by no means least, we have Erwin Reddell's Seeing Spartanburg in a New Light, opened in 2016, located in South California, USA. Funded by Bloomberg, Bloomberg Philanthropies and your $1 million public art challenge, this artist, the, sorry, this artist collaborated with the city's police department and selected neighborhood associations to design and develop 10 site-specific LED installations that have transformed open spaces to create safer, more vibrant neighborhoods for the community. Artwork Video Village in particular turned empty buildings due for demolition in April 2017 from a housing project into lanterns that face outward to tell their stories and cast their light into the surrounding community. Stories incorporate interviews and home movie footage to tell stories about the residents. The 10 projects ranged in forms such as programmed lighting installations integrated into existing buildings, a catenary system of brightly colored glass and a scrolling LED text installation suspended through a popular park walkway displaying works by a local poet. We believe that Reddell's installation for the city of Spartanburg helps to effectively reinforce the role that art can play in breaking down barriers and encouraging better community dialogue. The Spartanburg police chief said of the work that this is a proactive, positive collaboration with the police and the community. We're not closed-minded. This is 21st century law enforcement. The overall goal is to increase safety, beautify the city 
and essentially to bring people together. And that rounds off UAP's take on the best public art projects of 2016. Here's a quick roundup of those top 10 projects in summary for your reference. We would love to take questions now. If anyone would like to ask any questions, please send them through the Q&A messaging window. First up, we have a question about Rhonda Nonet's piece. Uh, piece. Um, the viewer has asked, is this a permanent work? Uh, the answer is that it's semi-permanent. So the piece is actually planned to be installed just for two years. It's due for deinstallation in 2018. I believe the month is April. Thanks for your question. We're just sorting through the next one, if you can hold with us. Okay, we also had a question from a viewer that said, what was the basic criteria in selecting work and is being viral important? Um, we did have a criteria in our selection, which we talked about just at the beginning, and I just want to summarise that again for your reference. So for us, we really were looking for a diversity of works, forms, types, mediums, because we are very much a multidisciplinary company and we really realise the um, importance of different artwork types and forms, especially for the public realm. We were also looking for works that were absolutely open to the public and allowed ease of access um, and viewability. We also wanted to look at works that demonstrated a really potent engagement with local and global audiences and also through strong conceptual rigour and innovative use of medium. And finally, we did also place an importance on a work's ability to poignantly engage in a dialogue with current historical, social and cultural issues. So in some ways, the ability to go viral did have an importance in our thinking because certainly it allowed us to see that it was reaching that uh, global audience. Thanks for your question. Hopefully that answered it. Next question. Um, someone's asked, I noticed that most of the works are male artists. Are there any female artists in the public art um, that's been shown? I think this is a great question. Um, certainly a lot of the projects that we're showing are actually collectives. Um, so in that sense, uh, there are a mix of genders within those groups. And of course, um, Miriam made our top list as well. Thanks for your question. I think this is a really interesting one. And, you know, I think it's something that we should think about. Next question, uh, one of our viewers said, you noticed that there are works coming from many different countries. Um, you've asked which countries has strong public art projects in general? Is there a trend? Is there any big reason why countries invest in public art? This is a lot of questions. I'm going to attempt to answer this as um, swiftly as possible. First up, yes, there are lots of countries and we really wanted to get a global um, capture because we were looking globally. So we've tried to represent a really good cross section. Having said that, I think there has been a bit of a trend. Um, we did see a lot of really great projects coming out of the US, which was interesting, um, particularly by the group Public Art Fund. Um, you also asked, is there a reason why countries invest in public art? This is a really big question. I don't know that I can answer this um, in this time frame, but uh, look, there are so many reasons that people uh, invest in public art. It has so many great benefits to public spaces. Um, it can, you know, really enhance the destination appeal of a place. It can bring economic benefits, of course, as well as social and cultural benefits. So um, great question. I think really relevant and certainly, um, you know, we, this is why we believe in public art. Uh, we had a really great question um, asking if UAP have been involved in any of these projects. Um, we specifically chose not to include any UAP projects on this list. Obviously, we would love to fill this list with our projects, but we feel that we're trying to, um, you know, uh, take a critical view here. We're trying to look outside of ourselves and this is about looking at exemplars uh, from out of, outside of our company. Um, so thanks for your question. Hopefully that answers that. Someone asked if UAP has visited all of these artworks. I wish. Um, unfortunately, no. We have experienced some of them, but um, certainly in future years, I plan to do a tour of all the works. That would be great. But in all earnest, um, no, we haven't had that opportunity. Um, but certainly we trawled through a lot of research and we really looked for viewers' um, uh, feedback on the projects to really get a first-hand understanding of the works in our um, in our criteria, we wanted to make sure these works really did have an amazing appeal to everybody who visited them. Um, 
Some of the works are no longer on show. Can you recommend anywhere that these artists have exhibitions currently showing? Um, so thanks. We had a question about can you recommend anywhere that these artists have exhibitions currently showing? Um, yes, a lot of artists do have shows still on. I did make some references to um, specific examples throughout. Um, I'm just trying to backtrack. We might actually look through those references and actually email that one to you if that's okay and then we can give you a lot more detail which hopefully will allow you to go and visit some of those. Thanks for your question. Um, we had a really good question saying, do you think that Instagram moments have raised the profile of public art? Um, I think absolutely. I think social media is an incredibly powerful tool in many ways. And because a lot of public art, um, you know, does have a very visual component to it, um, even in experi experiential work like Miriam's, people have captured shots of people walking around the street and um, experiencing the journey. And of course, with a lot of the more visual pieces, the likes of Ugo's work, you know, the kind of likes of taking a selfie in front of the work, certainly that um, aspect of going viral through people's Instagram accounts is really, really um, a, a big component in how a work is viewed, how it's perceived globally and how it trends. So Definitely, I think Instagram has a, has a major role to play in, in the popularity and the profile of public art and of artists in general. Um, great question here that said, um, does deconstructing other public art projects assist us, UAP, um, innovate and explore new ideas and mediums and how? Um, this is a fabulous question. Absolutely it does. I mean, any research, any understanding of projects and benchmarks absolutely enables us. And as a curatorial team, we're very interested in how works are commissioned, um, the collaborators involved, um, how they come into play, and that, that balance between, you know, the designers, the architect, the artist, the institute. So certainly this process of reviewing these kinds of projects is vital to how we work. And this is a process that we undertake almost daily in the studio um, as part of our work looking at research and, and really being across international benchmarks globally. Thanks for your question. Another great question. Uh, someone asked, what do you see as future trends in public art? Um, obviously, it's a little bit like um, gazing into a crystal ball, but I think from what we're noticing is that there is certainly a trend, even in these 10 projects, for quite ephemeral works or works that change or, um, you know, touch lightly within an environment. So moving away a little bit more from the traditional uh, physical sculpture, perhaps. And, um, you know, certainly we see that the audience engagement and that the experiential qualities and possibly the more immersive qualities of works in public space are very vital to um, people's enjoyment and what they're seeking in public art. Okay, and last question we're going to take now, but we're going to aim to answer any further questions via email because we really do want to get back to you all. We really thank you for your time. Um, so last one, this is a really tough one. Um, it's hard to find the balance between conceptual rigour and accessibility understanding. Do you think public art could be better at this? Do you think that public art should be conceptual? I'm just going to cut straight to the end of that question and say, yes, absolutely, there's a place for conceptual art practice within the public realm. And certainly a lot of the projects that we've highlighted today um, are highly conceptual and it's their conceptual rigour that led us to actually promote them into this top 10 selection. So yes, absolutely, public art can be conceptual. Um, certainly there's no requirement, but we do see that as, as a major component. Thanks for your question. Thank you all so much for joining. It's been great to have you all um, logging in and engaging. Thank you for all the questions. As I said, we're going to follow up with those last few by email. And just rounding off, thanks again for joining us. If you'd like to follow us, please do on Facebook, Instagram and LinkedIn. And, of course, you can join our, our mailing list. So please do reach out. We'd love to keep you updated with everything that we're doing.